On the 12th of May 1989, a freight train would begin its journey down the Cajon Pass in California, heading towards San Bernardino. For the crew on board, it was a routine journey. They did not, as the train crested the highest point of the pass, know that a miscalculation had already ensured that their train was doomed to derail, and that in doing so, it would start a chain of events that would lead to a devastating double disaster further down the line. Cajon Pass is a mountain pass in California's San Gabriel Mountains. It is located in the Mojave Desert and is a significant link between the San Bernardino area and the Victor Valley and Las Vegas areas. Trains have been traversing this pass since the early 1880s when the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway built the very first line through the pass to connect Barstow to San Diego. Another major rail company, the Southern Pacific Transportation Company, or Southern Pacific, also had a line running through the pass. Southern Pacific operated an extensive railroad network that came into existence in 1865, helping to pioneer the original transcontinental railroad. One of the major commodities Southern Pacific moved through the Cajon Pass in 1989 was Trona, a sand-like sodium carbonate compound mined by the company Lake Minerals. The day before the disaster, a Southern Pacific train arrived at Mojave Rail Yard with a cargo of Trona. The train consisted of three locomotives and 69 91,000 kilogram, or 100 ton, hopper cars loaded with Trona. Lake Minerals supplied paperwork for the yard clerk, including a bill of lading, a piece of paperwork bearing the details of the train's cargo. In this case, however, Lake Minerals had not filled out the weight. The yard clerk, Thomas Blair, called Lake Minerals, only to find their listed phone number no longer in service. Frustrated, he went out and inspected the train's cargo. He observed the loads of Trona and judged that they would weigh approximately the same as equivalent loads of coal. With this in mind, he estimated that each car weighed around 54,000 kilograms, or 60 tons. This put the estimated weight of the train at 5.5 million kilograms, or 6,150 tons overall. Just after 9pm, the crew arrived at the yard. This crew was made up of engineer Frank Holland, conductor Everett Crown, and brakeman Alan Rees, all of them experienced railway workers. The crew manned their locomotives, one of which could not be started. The defunct locomotive was switched out with another, and the train departed at a quarter past midnight on the 12th of May, bound for West Colton. The climb up the mountain was uneventful, though the train did stop in a siding to add helper units. Two extra locomotives were added to the train to provide assistance slowing the train down on steep downward gradients. The crew in these two additional locomotives were engineer Lawrence Hill and brakeman Robert Waterbury. The train now had four locomotives at the head end, 69 hopper cars, and two locomotives at the rear. A little after 2am, it left the siding and set off down the Cajon Pass. As the sun rose, the train reached the peak of the pass. The crew activated their dynamic brakes, a braking system which converts the kinetic energy of the train into electrical energy, slowing the train in the process. Air brakes were also activated. The train was meant to go no more than 40 kilometers per hour, or 25 miles per hour, down the mountain. Any faster would be unsafe for the curves along the route. At first, a safe speed was maintained, but soon conductor Everett Crown noticed the train had reached 48 kilometers per hour, or 30 miles per hour. He increased the brake pressure, but this did nothing. The speed continued to increase. Engineer Lawrence Hill observed the increasing speed in the helper units and knew something was amiss. He applied the emergency brakes. This slowed the train momentarily, but it quickly picked up speed again. Indeed, it began accelerating much faster, maxing out the speedometer on board. Smoke billowed from the wheels. Conductor Everett Crown contacted the West Colton Terminal's assistant general yard manager, reporting, we have a slight problem. I don't know if we can get this train stopped. Hearing this, engineer Lawrence Hill broke in, shouting, Mayday! 
Mayday, 7551 West Colton AGYM. We're doing 90 miles per hour. 9-0. Out of control. Won't be able to stop until we reach Colton. Despite this frantic call for help, nothing could be done. The crews braced themselves for the inevitable, and at 7.36am, the train flew off an elevated curve. Tragically, this curve was the location of the residential neighbourhood of Duffy Street in San Bernardino, which the train ploughed directly into. Seven houses were destroyed. The entire train derailed, with the first four locomotives and all 69 hopper cars completely wrecked. Trona spilled across the street. The rear helpers were damaged, but engineer Lawrence Hill and brakeman Robert Waterbury sustained only minor injuries. They were fortunate. Four people were killed. Two children in one of the damaged houses were suffocated under spilled Trona, while conductor Everett Crown and brakeman Alan Reese were crushed inside their locomotives. Miraculously, the other crew were injured, but survived. The crash was witnessed by police officers who happened to be nearby, and immediately called for further support. The rescue effort continued all day until almost everyone had been accounted for. The final trapped victim wasn't pulled out until a full 12 hours after the crash. The National Transportation Safety Board began an investigation. They found that many of the wheels, even a full day later, were glowing blue with intense heat. The event data recorders from the destroyed locomotives were retrieved for further scrutiny. While the investigation progressed, trains started running again four days after the crash, with shocked and grieving residents attempting to return to their normal lives. Thirteen days after the crash, however, a further disaster took place. At 8.05am on the 25th of May 1989, an underground pipeline at the crash site ruptured releasing a fountain of gasoline that fell on the local community, then ignited. The San Bernardino Fire Department were called back to the scene, but there was little they could do. The fire was so intense that some firefighting equipment began to melt, even at a significant distance from the fire. The gasoline came from a pipeline operated by Calnev Pipeline. It was fitted with emergency shutoff valves, but these failed to activate. It took seven hours to control the rupture and extinguish the flames. In that time, 11 more houses were destroyed, and two more people lost their lives. The ongoing investigation now had another question to answer. Had the crash contributed to the subsequent pipeline rupture? After much analysis, a conclusion was reached. The derailment had been a result of the train's weight being incorrectly calculated. When yard clerk Thomas Blair estimated the weight of the train, he made a gross miscalculation. The hoppers were filled to their maximum capacity with Trona, weighing 91,000 kilograms, or 100 tonnes each, not 54,000 kilograms, or 60 tonnes, as he had estimated. It was noted that, after the train had departed, a crew change took place at the yard. The new dispatcher caught Mr Blair's error and changed it in the computer system, but did not communicate with the crew on board the train. Further to this, three sets of dynamic brakes on the train were completely non-functional, though they made noises when activated that led the crew to believe they were working. In addition, the application of the emergency brakes automatically disabled the dynamic brakes on all locomotives, a safety feature intended to stop the wheels locking up and sliding. This combination of factors had doomed the train. Once it had crested the highest point of the pass, nothing could have been done to stop it. As for the pipeline rupture, investigators found tooth marks from heavy machinery on the section that had ruptured. This damage had likely been done during the cleanup operation. The investigation cleared the engineers and yard clerk Thomas Blair of any fault, as they had acted within reason. The blame lay with Southern Pacific and Calnef. Southern Pacific settled many claims out of court and changed operating practices at once. When calculating incomplete weights, it would now, by default, be assumed that hoppers were filled to maximum capacity, 
to ensure that enough braking power was put onto any given train. The Federal Railroad Administration, who had installed the safety feature that disabled the dynamic brakes, quickly reversed this change. Kalnev also settled several claims out of court. The land where Duffy Street once stood was made a no-build zone for many years. Trains still run past the area where the disaster took place. A memorial was also established by Southern Pacific employees further down the line in memory of their two fallen co-workers. <laughs>